We're in Cambridge Road here in Hanwell in West London and on the site of these townhouses behind us used to be a building called Athos House which is where I first worked. Uh, I was 18 years old, I came here in November of 1979 to begin work as a junior graphic designer stroke animator. So I'd been working here when it was Athos House. I'd been working on the ground floor in Pierce Studios for about uh, oh, two months. And on this particular day in the January of 1980, the R2D2 beat me further down the corridor in the BBC cutting rooms where I was not supposed to go. I loved science fiction, I knew exactly what it was, but I couldn't understand why would it be beeping in BBC premises. So I crept down the corridor to the far end of what was that building then. And there on the screen was uh, R2-D2 and Luke Skywalker. Now, this is so long ago, this is before The Empire Strikes Back had come out. And they were cutting a sequence, an insert sequence for a programme. So the guy said, oh, so you like science fiction? Um, have you ever heard of something called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Well, I was already a huge fan. And the guy I was talking to turned out to be Alan Bell. He said, yes, there is, and I'm going to produce it. So the next thing I said was, do you need any animation? I'm thinking like maybe a title sequence or something like that. And uh, he said, well, there's quite a bit of computer graphics in this first script. So I said, oh, well, uh, I work at the animation company next door. The animation for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is often referred to as computer graphics. Well, that's what we thought computers did in 1980. In actual fact, it was all hand-drawn. Yeah, the camera would be looking down at the artwork on the rostrum and it was all lit from below and that gave it that kind of neon look. Everything really began as pencil drawings. So there's the Babel Fish for instance until the BBC graphics guy said actually computers can't draw curvy lines, the computers draw in straight lines. But my boss Rod decided he'd do a compromise so there are more straight lines and it became this which is the famous image of the Babel fish. Here's, for instance, Rockfoss the Flatulent, charming name, one of the worst poets in the universe, and there he is with his book. And, and then that got taken into the darkroom and processed and became the backlit artwork, as you saw before. And endless sheets of transfer lettering that were then turned into a backlit piece of artwork that went under the rostrum and it was a build-up of many, many exposures on the same piece of film. And Douglas Adams used to come and visit the studio occasionally, and um, we found that um, why not put him in the animation? So there's a few little inserts, including here he is with bunches as Paul and Nancy Millstone Jennings, who was, you know, the worst poet in the universe, loosely based on one of his former schoolmates. Um, but again, again, all the lettering, to be uncovered with little bits of black card, letter by letter by letter, because in those days there was no computer that could do that style of lettering. All the sort of things that you can do on your own computer now, all had to be done through a long, laborious process back in 1980. I first met Douglas Adams to interview him for a fan magazine, Doctor Who fan magazine called TARDIS. I was asked to bring my new tape recorder, in fact I think my friends wanted my tape recorder more than they wanted me, and when he just started job as script editor of Doctor Who and so I didn't see him again I, thought, I think I saw him once in the BBC bar where I used to go and crash out. Got to know him properly uh, throughout 1980 working on the Hitchhiker's Guide TV series um, but the first meeting uh, during that year I missed because I arrived at work and he'd been to view the first half of the Babelfish sequence and to meet my boss Rob Lord and that but uh, they'd come very early morning and I didn't start till 10. So when I got in, I found there was something waiting for me. My boss, Rod, had said, uh, oh, we've got a young chap who's met you. He says he knows you a bit. Um, uh, perhaps you could leave him a note. And so Douglas did, so I found this on my desk. A little note that says, sorry to have missed you. Best wishes, Douglas Adams. And uh, it meant a lot to me at the time. I kept it, it's usually in a scrapbook at home. Um, and it features uh, right towards the end of the book that I've just done about Douglas, which is called 42, The Wildly Improbable Ideas of Douglas Adams. And that's available now uh, from unbound.com.